Hello everyone. Um, today I saw it in the chat, who is this guy, Ben Biedermann, can he come to the stage? So clearly I'm new to this community. And one reason why I tried to find you and why I'm here is because I'm frustrated. For close to two years, I've been working in publicly funded projects on so-called decentralized identity or self-sovereign identity. And I've been frustrated with a couple of things because pseudonymity was not taken seriously, but really it was about control. And the Monero community has not been living under a rock for the past five to seven years, clearly, because we've heard it today in the morning that we need to prepare, or some of us want to prepare and want to opt out. Now, this all created somewhat of an identity crisis because I didn't belong, or I didn't feel like I belong. And there we already are, identity. Identity is not just a technical concept. It's not just something that we implement and pilot. It's something that we feel here, and that's why I'm here today. But I want to talk about the technical side as well, because in the end, here we go. In the end, it's a social concept, and it's a social technology if we think about how we conceptualize identity and how we bring it into tech. Now, some of you, do I have a pointer? Some of you may have seen like this kind of prison um, outlay or ground plan. Uh, it's the panopticum. So basically the concept that you introduce social control by making the subjects aware that they are being controlled. This doesn't need someone watching in the middle all the time. It is enough that someone in the cell thinks that he or she is being watched. So which implications does it have when we talk about EIDAS, when we talk about decentralized identity, when we talk about digital identity in general um, and introduce it to a community, to a society? What, does it, what kind of implication does it have if we talk about publishing view keys on a large scale? Do they need to necessarily monitor every single transaction? No. It is enough that we know that we're being controlled. So that's why social technology is a technization of new administrative powers and authority that subject us, that subject the individual, but also the collective. Now, Monero shares some properties with my actual background. So I'm a small island states researcher um, so I come quite from the social sciences. And we have this concept in small jurisdictions, small island studies, it's called peripherality. So what it means is that there is some distance to the center. And clearly Monero isn't the top one cryptocurrency being used. So there is some degree of peripherality to the big chains, to Bitcoin, to Ethereum. Yet Ethereum and Bitcoin, they're driving all the demand and they're driving all the demand in decentralized identity. So we need to use this to our advantage because if the big players are into decentralized identity, if big money is coming in and funding public-private partnerships, developing solutions that are not privacy-oriented, then we're pretty much going to lose out. So we can use peripherality to our advantage because we can create a safe haven. We can use it to try out different things. We can experiment because we are not so closely watched as maybe perhaps developments on Ethereum, but so-called Web3. So we see that Bitcoin has a decentralized identity method. It's called DIT method. We have Ethereum, we have Solana, um, and what they do is they persist identities on public ledgers. So you really write your identity, your metadata to an identifier that is persistent because once you've transacted, there's no way to detach it. And even more so, like the most prevalent implementations 
store your metadata on IPFS? Well, you can decrypt, encrypt it and you can take all kinds of um, measures to, to minimize the impact, but it's still persisted um, there. So we saw around maybe five, six, seven years ago that something called the Hyperledger Foundation forked Ethereum and created an, a standard to, well, um, store metadata in a, in a certain way. And they called it anonymous credentials and they used similar technology to Monero. Um, and what they did, what it created is you could have identity data that has some reference to a distributed ledger, but that is not traceable. So basically what they did is they disconnected the, the persistence of the identity data from the encryption of the session. Um, and the Hyperledger Foundation and the technology drove a lot of use cases, piloted um, within the European Union, uh, within um, the US, within Canada. So the uh, so British Columbia, for example, was pretty big on decentralized identity and has an implementation. But then something changed, and I, we heard it in our previous talk. So EIDAS was referenced. So EIDAS is basically an, a framework, a trust framework of the European Union where they well, set out a bunch of rules, how you can perform digital signatures, how you can prove that you are yourself, that you can do KYC. Um, and it's getting renewed. So EIDAS2 um, is introducing a di digital identity wallet. Now this digital identity wallet is something that is vague. Um, it's not quite clear, or not until um, recently, it was not quite clear what kind of technology goes in there, how self-sovereign is going, it is going to be. But what came out is in around about February, that's not decentralized at all because it, it follows a lineage of measures of control. So I think around the 1990s, 2000s, we got all these fancy um, chip cards called identity cards and you had some cryptographic material on it, we even have today, um, and you, you could you know, pass a border electronically, they could scan this chip and you could even perform in some countries electronic signatures. Um, and then recently the International Standards Organization issued something that's called an MDL, a mobile driving license. So it just took the, the card to the next level and put it on the phone. And now the European Commission is updating their EIDAS regulation um, called EIDAS2, nice fancy catchy name. Um, and they're going to use the standard. So national identity schemes are supposed to be a prudent approach or um, people who have worked on these schemes at least call it this way. So what you have, you have a hardware secure module in a, a Java smart card which is encrypted and it, it can be misused. I mean if you hold, for example, your passport at an electronic border gate, so like this fancy thing where like you scan your passport and then you go through this gate and they scan your biometrics, well, it uses cryptography, um, no joke. So they're gonna scan your face, like measure like your eyes and measure like your, your forehead and hash this and compare it to a hash that is stored on this card. And you even can identify yourself online. So if you perhaps want to sign a contract, you could potentially use this to, well, I mean, perform a qualified electronic signature. So prove that you are really you. Um, but there's a caveat because they disabled it in a lot of specifications where they, the specifications set out that it shall not be used because well, what they really want to do is they want you to go to a service where you upload all your identity 
documents, your documents you want to sign, and these services want to make money, and they can process your data. So you have a high degree of centralization um, just because someone decided even that we have the capability of these identity data, um, it should not be used for you to be able to just sign a contract decentrally. Now, when we talk about EIDAS, we take this on the next level. We take this on our mobile phones that are, well, surveyed, that are not really secure, um, that, that listen um, what we say, what we do, that monitor us. So the mobile driving license introduces um, a new set of cryptographic measures and combines that with existing measures. So while we saw in the previous slide that they, they warn um, about this kind of like, cryptographic um, algorithms and operations being used to track someone, they now say, well, it provides better privacy than performing a, a signature over data that you present. Well, that's true, but why do you introduce either of these measures, or why do you give either of this option if, at the end of the day, all what you want to do is track this person owning a mobile driving license? Now, I can understand that in a, in a context where you operate a vehicle, um, that a police officer might want to make sure that you, was, that you were not arrested because, or um, your driving license revoked because of drunk driving. But if you do this to an identity document that is general purpose, that every one of us will own, then we have a problem because they can just revoke the identity document and they can track us every single step on the way. So a couple of people at the um, IETF, so the Internet Engineering Task Force, like were provided with this problem and we said, well, we, we, we had this solution back then um, from the Hyperledger Foundation. So they, they kind of developed the standard and now we kind of want to do um, the mobile driving license. So please provide us with like a privacy preserving way of presenting claims. So claims are, um, my name is Ben, in a structured way encoded into the the document itself. So, so what they did is they they came up with salted hashes and and kind of sold it as like the 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 newest stuff, um, even though it's been around for quite some time. And they still say, well, we, we we can do something about the claims. We can we can encrypt that your name is Ben, and you don't have to disclose that your name is Ben, but what we're going to do is we're still going to persist your identifier. We're still going to require you dis to disclose your public key, public key and persist it in the document that you're going to present. And the key you use to present this document in a secured session is going to be the same one to which your identity data is persisted. So it doesn't really matter how salty this hash is, uh, you're still doxed. Um, and then returning to the EIDAS regulation, saying, well, we, we started out doing pretty anonymous credentials um, that were then kind of mixed up or, or got mixed up in this whole mobile driving license debacle, which is now being used to, well, track every single one of us if we ever want to use an eSIM or open a bank account um, in the European Union, um, we, we're still gonna want to specify how we, how we actually get this identifier because the MDL, neither, neither the MDL nor um, anonymous credentials really did say something about the method how this identity is created. So EIDAS came around and they said, well, we, we have all these privacy preserving ways of creating public keys. They can be generated decentrally, but 
No, really. What, what, what we want to do is we want to know every single person every single time they present this credential. So they came up with something which is called a PID. Um, it's a personal identifier. So what they, what they did is they, they took public private key um, cryptography and persisted it on a personal level. So when you, when you look in um, the architecture reference framework, so the reference for implementation, you're going to find a whole bunch of attributes that is going to be um, associated with your public key. So you, you have your current family name, you have your current first name, family name at birth, um, your current address, your place of birth, your date of birth, and this is all attached to a unique identifier that is written into the claim structure itself, into the credential, and used to present these credentials. So there's pretty much no way around this and you not or, or circumventing KYC. Um, so what can we do as a community to, to kind of like face this new reality? What, what can we do so that we, we comply without being complicit? We could come up with our own dead method, method that is uh, privacy pre preserving and yet authentic. And we heard previously um, that we could use um, our view keys, but really, I don't think it's a good idea to, to give away these keys and, and let them view our transactions. So what we could do is we could rely on what the Bitcoin did method already trialed. So we could take a transaction hash um, that we create through with our Monero addresses. And this transaction hash is, is somewhat persisted on chain, but all the, the metadata um, that we are going to associate with this identifier to prove our identity is stored off chain. And we could even make use of sub accounts um, or sub addresses within the Monero ecosystem um, that allows us to minimize the identity management overhead. And the, the, the great chance is because the, the PID in the IDAS is persistent, like you get it once, it is provi provisioned centrally, and then you keep it, we could enable key rotation. So by doing this, we, we could permission how much of our transaction history how much of our identity we present to verifiers? How much do we present to um, perhaps the, the magic fund when we apply for a grant? Or how much do we want to um, like show when we sign up for the Monero GitLab? Um, so we can enable uh, an authentic rot rotation of keys if we desire to do so, or we can just stay anonymous and basically not reveal our previous keys. Um, so it kind of abstracts away from the, the ledger level and it builds an architecture around it um, that could potentially look like, the, look like this. So we have the Monero network in the bottom. We can still provide IPFS for um, the storage of institutional did documents so of institutional identities where we say, all right, there is, there is a, a corporation um, that, that uses Monero identity to perhaps issue a, an employment statement or something. Um, so we, we could still have like this transparency, but everything that is related to end users, to natural persons, would be in, in a wallet um, so that we clearly distinguish between the network level and the identifier management level um, without doing everything on chain because chains still persist our transactions whether we are going to reveal them or not. They're still there. People might not be able to see them, but they're there. So perhaps we should, when we think about how we can have a competing approach that is close to our community values, how we can adhere to 
what is specified without doing everything here, so without risking um, persisting too much. Now, this is these are my references. I'm happy to uh, get into the details, uh, and I'm looking forward to your questions and remarks. Thank you very much.